order for a man to have the same kind of level of choice, and, you know, the same level of abundance of choice with women, then a man has to go through the process of, you know, uh, overcoming like neediness and desperation and uh, and this scarcity mindset that that men are uh, that men are conditioned with. I mean, uh, you know, it, it is true that uh, that. When, when they say that women love confidence, because when you when you're confident, you're much less likely to be coming from a scarcity mindset, because because otherwise you, you're just needy and desperate, and you're like a parasite. And parasites are not not attractive, you know. But um, but now the uh, the but in in this there's no. I mean, the shame is all coming from uh, the imposition of shame is all coming from the ideology of Ingsoc, the the idea that uh, that sex is dirty and wrong, and uh, and you know, and it's a source of corruption, you know, and that that's why they're trying to eradicate the uh, the the act of uh, you know natural procreative methods of sexual sexual intercourse. But uh, but it's straight it's, it. <sighs> Because in our current society, if a guy were to ask how many guys have you slept with, and if she said, I've slept with hundreds of men, a lot of guys would be negatively affected by that because, you know, those men would also have have been indoctrinated by this whole idea of slut-shaming, that somehow it's bad for a woman to have slept with hundreds of men, when in fact, you know, it's perfectly fine for a guy to. Um, but But in this instance, you know, it's almost as though Winston sees that as as an indicator that it is okay to have sex with her because she's in because the thing is if she's engaged with illicit affairs with hundreds of party members in the manner that he is about to then it's a sign that she is free of the ideology of purity an ideology which he despises you know um but uh, but it this, this is so compelling for both of them, right? Um, it's, it's so compelling and right for both of them because they have had purity imposed upon them. You know, sexuality is a natural expression of humanity. It's a, you know, a psychologically, emotionally, physically, and dare I say spiritually beneficial activity. I know for, <laughs> you know, I, I know for a fact. Um, so, when you suppress that, even to the point of eradicating the orgasm, which the party's purity movement advocates, you breed contempt and inevitably rebellion. Now, this this is why, you know, I mean, one of the one of the jokes that uh, that um, that Joe Rogan has, even though it does have a lot of validity and truth, that you know, what are the dirtiest kind of girls around? Ex-Catholic schoolgirls. <laughs> Because they've had the the vast majority of their formative years and also the years their adolescent years having their sexuality repressed, suppressed, and oppressed. Um, so and and that sort of that that incentivizes a, a sort of like a snapback effect, sort of like a rubber band snapback effect, where you know where the woman like you can't stop me having sex anymore, and then they like go out and have like lots of promiscuous sex because the the you know the the I mean sex is a natural drive of human beings. If sex wasn't a natural drive then we wouldn't have survived to this point. Let's let's be honest. And uh, and when when you suppress something, you know, it's kind of like there, there was a picture I saw on Facebook a few weeks ago where there was uh there was this, like a cartoon picture of like um like a a seedling sprouting up out of the ground and then like a big thumb holding down the plant and then the next picture shows that if the plant essentially it demonstrates that if the can't if the plant can't grow upwards then its roots extend far and wide you know nature finds a way as you know as uh, the character um dr ian malcolm in uh, in Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park books uh, denotes that life always finds a way. So so yeah, it's it's very much like you know if you're overly strict with your children and repeatedly tell them not to do something without giving an adequate reason why, then the tendency is to do the opposite. 
and and not just that but they will take great pleasure <laughs> in doing the opposite i mean i i myself you know i you know i was a very rebellious child i loved doing the things that i was told not to do and 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 looking back in retrospect i wasn't necessarily doing them because i recognized that they should be done but i was doing them because i was being told not to do them yeah this is why the sex between winston and julia has such power you know that's why the, the orgasms that they that they uh, accomplished in in that sex were such, such powerful because they were unrestricted they were unsuppressed you know because sexuality should not be suppressed but uh, but winston uh, also begins to uh, rent a room above the uh, the pawn shop um and julia also comes to spend time with him so and you know she brings like real food stuff supposedly stolen from the stores of the inner party now the inner party is sort of like a almost like an elite uh, an elite part of the party itself it's like a much small it's sort of like the one percent as it were but they um you know they they enjoy privileges that normal outer party members don't but it tells us that uh, that regular party members are rationed with low grade substitutes i mean there's a there's a scene towards the beginning where parsons is like remark cuz they're in like the canteen and he's re- and he's remarking with pleasure that the uh, that the the meat that they're eating isn't actually meat it looks like meat it tastes like meat but it's not meat double plus good <laughs> you know um, and th- you know this is also indicative of the fact that uh, that even though they're you know th- I mean, we normally complain about the fact that we're not um, that you know a lot of the food that we have is not actually food but food like products but uh, but in in the world of o- in the world of the in the, uh, the the party of Oceania they're completely pleased with the fact that they're not actually eating real meat or food or whatever but uh, but yeah only the inner party members are granted access to real food like real sugar real coffee um, like proper bread and all that sort of stuff I mean um, but uh, I mean there in that rented room uh, both Winston and Julia enjoy uh, time in what appears to be a safe haven you know, it's like their own their own little world of tranquility away from the control of the party where they can just hang around and just enjoy each other's company, have sex and sleep together. Um, almost as though they can enjoy life as a pro, if only for a few hours a day. Um, Winston remarks in his journal uh, that and, and this is uh, this is quite a quite a powerful uh, notion in the in the book that uh quote freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two equals four if that is granted all else follows this means that in a world such as oceania lies have become the norm thus eradicating the truth from perception and in order to be able to align with truth is to be free from said lies And if the truth were to take hold, then lies would become meaningless and obsolete. Herein lies the secret to freedom from oppression. Truth must always be allowed to prevail over myths, truths and untruths. To enslave a society, one must have to replace the truth with lies. This is why one of the main slogans of the party is, War is peace. Freedom is slavery ignorance is strength this is known as double speak uh, the replacement of a truth with its opposite thus eradicating what was once virtuous with non-virtuous ideas thus enabling a society to be turned on its head and to fully accept as virtue that which once objectively was considered as non-virtue um, if you can get a society to accept that if you strive for what is objectively freedom to actually be slavery, you can condition a society to beg for enslavement while thinking that that is actually freedom. 
I mean, this is what has been achieved for, for the party members and what we as a society must recognise if we ever hope to be truly free. You know, because, uh, I mean, for those of you who are uh, comic book fans or at least have, have watched uh, the film Avengers Assemble, uh, you'll notice that uh, that Loki's whole whole spiel is that uh, is is this whole thing that that freedom is slavery. He, you know, he's of this twisted mindset that to strive for freedom is actually slavery itself, and that the and to advocate slavery is and you know slavery is true freedom. You know, because uh, cause there's a there's a, a scene in uh, in in the city of uh, of Stuttgart where uh, where he has like a huge uh, group of people like kneeling on the ground, and he says, "Is this not your natural state? You were made to be ruled." You know, that is the mindset of the oppressor. You know. Um, but uh, but luckily we have an immune response against this kind of thing. We call them whistleblowers. Now, obviously, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, with the revelations of uh, of WikiLeaks and uh, of uh, you know of Chelsea Manning, um, of the revelations of Edward Snowden and uh, and what he revealed. Yeah, because I mean, there, I remember there was a point in time when if you told people that uh, that there are governmental organisations that were spying on you, that were illegally wiretapping your phones, and you know, and keeping keeping data you know, like data logs of uh, of you know transactions, conversations, um, you know, things that you post up on Facebook. People would call you a conspiracy theorist. However, Edward Snowden comes out, reveals all this information about how that stuff is actually happening, and it gets news coverage as well. Suddenly, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, we're yeah we're getting uh, we're getting spied on, but um, but I don't care. I've got nothing to hide, and because <laughs> I actually remember when th- when this first came out. Uh, actually, this was covered on the Jeremy Vine show, and the kinds of comments that people would make, right? People would actually say, "Well, if you've got nothing to hide, then you've got nothing to fear." Right? They would repeat this slogan, and I would say to them, "Are you actually aware that you are actually quoting? Um, you, you are actually quoting the words of a propaganda minister of the Third Reich? Are you actually aware of that?" Yeah, I think was it uh, Hermann Goering or was it Joseph Goebbels who who said that? It was, it was one of those two guys. But he actually said that uh, you know, if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear, or or the other way around. But uh, but yeah, people were repeating that sort of stuff, not even realizing that they were legitimizing this kind of thing. They were legitimizing the fact that we are being spied on. And <laughs> I'll tell you what. To add uh, to add insult to injury, to add the icing on the cake, all right? In response to Edward Snowden's revelations about how the government is spying on us, guess what they're trying to they're trying to uh, to charge Edward Snowden with spying. <laughs> oh God, where's a wall? Where's a wall? Okay, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> It's so strange that, you know, we we will charge you with espionage for revealing how the government is engaging in espionage. You couldn't make this shit up, could you? Well, actually, no. Orwell did. But, no, th- I mean, this is why we need to protect whistleblowers. This is why we need to respect and support whistleblowers and share the information that they're sending out, like... Like with the article that I read out earlier in this podcast, the um, the wars are not necessarily going to be fought with bullets and explosives, but with data, with information. You know, if there, if there's anything that WikiLeaks and Edward Snowden have realised, uh, uh, not realised, have um, uh, 
have revealed to us is that knowledge is power information is both a tool and a weapon right but we must respect those tools and weapons we must respect them right the internet is a wonderful tool for transferring information sharing information we must protect the internet we must protect those who are actually putting their necks out on the line suffering the brunt um, because the establishment realizes that people are being told what they don't want them to know so that being said back back to the back to the review um in a conversation between winston and o'brien and in a and in a party member winston is clued into a, a thing called uh, the 10th edition of the new speak uh dictionary i mean winston in um in many trees he's, uh, he's still using the ninth edition but he gets told about this 10th edition um and is even given o'brien's address to go and go and pick one up uh, when he arrives, O'Brien uh, reveals that he actually has the privilege of turning off his telescreen, um, albeit for only 30 minutes a, at a time. However, the, this does allow for some privacy. But O'Brien reveals uh, that the elusive resistance is in fact very real and operating underground. You know, the reason for such denial of such a thing is critical to its longevity as one cannot betray, if captured and interrogated, a resistance that one is not even aware exists, or one that does not even believe exists. So when Winston takes this dictionary back to his apartment, however, he discovers that hidden inside like double-layered pages is the manifesto of Emmanuel Goldstein, entitled The Theory and Practice of Oligarch to oligarchical collectivism which he begins to read with fervor even to a dozing julia lying naked beside him their life of tranquility is however shattered uh, when they realize that all along there has been there's been a masked telescreen in the wall uh, and the room is raided by the fort police uh, winston is kept in a room uh, within the ministry of love uh, here he learns that o'brien is not actually uh, his friend at all but has betrayed him he's then tortured and interrogated uh, he's told that he is inherently defective and must be cured his every thought of rebellion against big brother a delusion of consciousness that must be eradicated in order to normalize him to toe the party line as it were i mean excuse the pun but i mean if you think about it that's I think that might have been where the, where the term comes from, actually, to toe the party line. Um, but during the torture, O'Brien utilises a classic uh, deconstruction technique, wherein uh, he takes a truth that corresponds to Winston's memory and twists it into affirming that said truth was nothing but a delusion. For instance, the actual change of enemy from uh, Eurasia to East Asia into the idea that Oceania has always been at war with East Asia. You know, this idea of replacing the truth with a lie combined with torture is a classic method of uh, coercing compliance uh, and a change of perception uh, from a human being and enforcing a new reality into their mind uh, o'brien introduces more replacements such as you know he holds up four fingers um and telling him that he is in fact holding up five uh, by torturing him for giving the factually correct answer um accusing him of lying and posing the new answer winston eventually is forced to actually believe that there are in fact five fingers and there were always five fingers, because obviously this uh, this does uh, this does follow a process where, you know, at first he says, you know, I I don't know what I don't know what to tell you. I see four, but I I, I don't I don't know what I don't know what to tell you. What what, what do you want me to say? And it like, keeps going, and then eventually he says, you know, I don't know. You know, because I mean, this shows that his his perception is being broken down. 
and um and I think it's either at this point or when he actually says, I want to see five, but I can't. I But I want to see them. And, you know, and it's, at the, it's at this point where O'Brien says, you know, that's better. So obviously it's about breaking down. I mean, the military does this as well. I mean, uh, for any of you who's... Um, who, you know, there, there was a show on ITV called Bad Lads Army. Does anyone remember that? It was on ITV. I, th- I think you could probably find a few episodes of it on YouTube. Uh, I've, I've tried to, I've tried to find it um, online, but I can't, I can't find it anywhere. I, I mean, I might have to see if I can, you know, go to um, go to some place where it sells like DVD box sets of it because there was quite a few series of it. But the whole idea of the program was to uh, was to put essentially chavs and wannabe gangster chavs. Um, into uh, into like a sort of re- uh, reconstruction of uh, of Second World War national service, and uh, like the whole the whole idea of what they try to do to um, to like reform these guys is to progressively break them down psychologically and then rebuild them with their new mindset of uh, of discipline and obedience, and this is exactly what O'Brien was doing to winston and you know i mean it just goes to show that the perfect way to force a change of reality is to confuse the mind so much that the person will just buckle and accept any reality as long as the acceptance of that reality and an alignment with that reality is rewarded with the cessation of pain I mean, Winston is tortured to the point of losing all concept of time, sanity, and even health as his body begins to deteriorate. I mean, th- there's there's a part where uh, where O'Brien like basically releases him, tells him to get up, uh, which he eventually manages to do, and he stands him in front of a mirror. And th- right, this guy, right, Winston, by this point is he's emaciated he's he's his head has been shaved and like o'brien even like just easily just pulls out one of his teeth you know that shows how bad he's actually getting basically because because it's at this point where winston is still like showing some resistance where he's basically saying you know there's something about mankind we will rise up and tear you to pieces it's the spirit of man and uh, he says really you think you're a man and, he, and this is why he brings him up in front of the mirror to basically say, "This is what remains of man." You know, and it's oh, it's it's a scary concept, but um, but it, I mean, it even gets to the point where uh, when when the pain is seized, he begins to vocally express love for O'Brien. He actually looks at him and says, "I love you." Now. In part, this is due to his hallucinating mind uh, projecting Julia's visage on top of O'Brien's, but it's also due to a phenomenon known as Stockholm Syndrome. If anyone's familiar with Stockholm, um, Stockholm Syndrome, you know what I'm talking about. If, if not, look this up. It's, uh, it, it's, it's a phenomenon where uh, victims uh, begin to sympathise and even develop so much as romantic attachments to their aggressors like you know with in situations like you know kidnappings or hostage situations you know there's uh there's i think there's something like a 30 or something percent of um of most um most victims of like hostage situations exhibit uh stockholm syndrome it's strange because uh, you know there there is an equivalent in our current society of this. Um, it comes in. It also like ties back to the whole um, self-appointed guardians of the status quo, uh, where people they they know that politicians don't care about them. They know that politicians lie. They know that politicians steal. They know that politicians cannot be trusted, and yet they still vote for them and they still say well you have to vote if you don't vote then you've got no right to complain well as i uh, as i got reminded of by a uh, by a, 
uh, by a picture that I saw recently on uh, on Facebook. The um, there was a picture of a, a pile up, and it said, uh, you know, blaming uh, blaming non voters for political problems is like vote is like blaming non drivers for car accidents. You know, I mean, George Carlin said it best that uh, that that the the, the the notion itself is actually backwards to what it actually is you know if if you do vote then you are to blame because you're the ones who voted them in the people who didn't vote have no part to play in it they they are not responsible whatsoever you know we've been duped into thinking that the only way that we can address the political system is by giving it validity by voting you know and and people and people think well you've got to vote for someone no you don't <laughs> why do why you know why do you think that voting makes any kind of difference what's oh, I've I've gone I've gone into that but back to the back to the review um after hearing that Winston will still not love Big Brother, O'Brien reminds him that obedience isn't enough. He has to love Big Brother. So Winston is taken to room 101, a place where your worst fears are made a reality. In O'Brien's own words, he says, it's the worst thing in the world. And for Winston, it's rats. Um, and he's shown like this uh, this weird uh, constructed cage, whereas like there's two compartments and there's two starved rats in this cage. Um, that's mount and the cage is mounted onto his face, and he gets told that when the door to the cage is opened, they will ju- they will burst forth and start to eat through and tunnel their way into his skull, thus killing him. He eventually relents um, and does what he never thought he would do. He pleads that Julia were to suffer this fate instead. Because if you think about it, by that point, Winston has been so brutalised and so traumatised by by these interrogations and tortures that you know he gets he he thinks that his only way out he says do this to julia i don't care what you do to her but do this to her instead and on while on the surface of it that seems to be like you know an unforgivable betrayal but if you were to picture yourself in winston's place would you be able to resist trying to offer someone else up to suffer your fate instead of you The, uh, the last time we see Winston, uh, he's playing chess uh, in the Chestnut Cafe. Um, even when Julia sit, comes in and sits opposite him, he, sh- he shows no signs of affection, no familiarity, just silent indifference. It appears that the torture has reverted both of them back to before we even started. You know, before the rebellious thoughts, before the affair... Reset back to factory settings. On the telly screen, we see Winston actually giving a detailed, albeit exaggerated and fabricated confession of his crimes against Big Brother, as all reformed party members make for public consumption and create and creating further deterrence against sedition and dissent. But that's the kind of world that that we're left with by the end of the film and as you can tell it's it's not one that that any of us would really want uh, even though as i've described in in this podcast we are moving towards it i mean one of the one of the main things that i neglected to mention up until this point is the actual um the actual emulation of the the idea of surveillance and big brother itself in the form of the uh, the channel 4 uh, reality show called big brother which i think by now I, th- I i mean i don't know how many seasons there have been of it now it's been going for going for over 10 years and uh it it's 
it's almost engendered a culture that is pleased to be surveilled. Almost like we recognise that our own lives have such little meaning and such little impact that if we were to be paraded around in front of millions of people 24-7 via cameras, then somehow we can gain our 15 minutes of fame, as it were, and almost like, you know, to feed a narcissistic and voyeuristic culture. I mean, I've, I've, I've known people that not only... I mean, because... Because the the conditioning goes even further than that, you know, even further than the contestants who want to be surveilled 24 hours a day for the consumption of audiences. But I've known people who their whole lives are are supported and reinforced by their their addiction to programs like Big Brother. You know, I've, I've known people who they can't even function properly unless they've watched a couple of hours of some brain-dead fucking moron sitting on a couch talking shit to other brain-dead morons in a house that's full of cameras. You know, I mean, even the, right, even the, co- even the co-op that's across the road from me, right... It's a it's a it's a small co-op. I mean, you know, oh, not um, normally when when we think of because it's it used to be in all days, but it's uh, but it was like you know taken over by the co-op. But it's a very small shop, and it's got a little post office at at the back. It's a very small one, but guess how many security cameras they have in that small shop? I counted them fourteen. One four fourteen security cameras for quite a small shop. That is severely fucking paranoid, you know? And this is the kind of culture that we're becoming. We're becoming a culture that isn't necessarily paranoid about being filmed, you know, if it's CCTV. Because this is the one thing that that I've found with my street activism. When people, like, come up to me and, like, the police harass me and, like, there's private security that harass me, they sort of, like, put their hand up and say, I don't wish to be filmed. And I say to them, dude, there's a CCTV camera right up there and it's been recording you all this time. Why do you not wish to be filmed by that? And, like, there was an instance when uh, when me and the guys from Occupy Worthing, uh, we were doing a... Um, we were doing a little demonstration against Poundland for their support of the uh, the workfare scheme. You, you can find this video on YouTube. Actually, it's a very interesting uh, video. That well, there was two separate videos uh, that uh, that were made. Um, I think it was uh, by um, uh, I can't remember the name of the YouTube channel who because uh, uh, Joel Shepard was the guy who uh, who basically shot these um i can't remember what his uh, his youtube channel is but if you go onto youtube and look for occupy worthing poundland there's two different videos that joel put up and then i myself uh, put up the raw footage um but the uh but yeah the uh, there was these there were these group of uh, people who were claiming that because we were filming ourselves doing this sort of thing that supposedly we were filming their children and that, i mean this is the i mean this gets into like really emotionally charged like you know murky territory where people start saying you're filming children because that starts becoming a sort of slippery slope of accusing us of being pedophiles and uh, and we would say well well, there's CCTV cameras recording you, and they're like, no, that's different, because CCTVs are there to protect us. <laughs> they don't like to be filmed, but they're perfectly fine with being filmed by CCTV cameras. You know, and, and while I do recognise that CCTV does have its, uh, have its, you know, use and function in terms of public protection and, you know, gathering of evidence of, of any crimes, um, you know, that, you know, that is used as its main justification to, to sort of legitimise the, um, you know, the data mining uh, purposes that a lot of them are being used for. Um, but, you know, as I said, this is the kind of world that we're starting to 
to move into. The, you know, we we live in a world where the vast majority of people are just blind, bleating fucking sheep to the established order. They believe that the only way to ad- redress and address the problems of our society is to, you know, legitimise the system itself by voting. That uh, that you know that the solutions um, can only be brought forth by the proposals of politicians, and especially if the if the media conditions us to think that immigrants are the problem, then a political party that centres mainly on addressing the and the immigration problem. You know, people get duped into thinking that that is actually the solution to the problem. There, I tell you what, there's a um, there's a video on YouTube um, that uh, it uh, it um, chronicles a uh, like a short interview between um, I can't remember the uh, the name of the DJ, but it was uh, a London uh, radio station called LBC, and um, and they were they were basically covering the whole UKIP thing. And uh, and there was a caller who was basically defending UKIP. And uh, if, if you if you go on YouTube and just search for LBC, uh, what do UKIP stand for, or what are UKIP for, or something along those lines? And it's uh, and it's it's a short video where basically this person is ba- uh, you know advocating you know the voting for UKIP. But the DJ was basically asked him, but what do, what do UKIP stand for? And all this guy could could say is about the immigration thing. And he was like, no, we, no, that's what they're against. We know what they're against, but I'm asking you, what are they for? And this guy could not answer the question. He could not answer it because he has not been conditioned to think critically. He's not been educated properly to actually think maybe politicians should be assessed on their policies their actual policies of what they're for as opposed to what they're against because the thing is with politicians i mean politicians mainly tell you how good they are by telling you how bad the others are that's the thing they 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 explain the validity of their party by by trying to smear other parties. I mean, this, I I even had like a conservative, uh, conservative sort of canvasser knock on my door once, and and I was basically just like engaging them in conversation because I, I love to, uh, having these kind of discussions. And eventually, I t- I had to say to them, please tell me what good things you do without framing it as a criticism of any other political party. And he couldn't do it. He could not do it because. The, the way that we've been conditioned in this society is to just blindly regurgitate the rhetoric of the establishment, you know. And and while the world of Oceania itself, is, you know, it is quite a bit of a far cry from the society we have right now, but considering things like, say for example... You know, in Star Wars, there's the, there's the whole thing of like the stormtroopers, and we recognise that sort of like regimental, you know, clone soldier thing of don 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 da don don. We you know we recognise that as like something that is um, something that is blatantly oppressive. We think that uh, we think that uh, the, you know we're saved from that kind of thing right now. But if you look in the United States at some of the uh, some of the like real like scary militarization of the police, where they're actually bringing like you know uh, military vehicles into the streets to enforce uh, to enforce like you know uh, urban pacification, it's we're slowly inching towards that kind of oppressive world and I for one do not want us to go there I want us to be able to prevent that kind of world you know 
I mean, I could I could sit here with you for hours and hours and hours and hours and talk through all the different things that shows us that we're that that we're going in this direction. I mean, I, this this podcast has been like you know maybe uh, over over two hours <laughs> that I've been talking about this, but uh, but you know the the evidence is there, right? It's up to you to make sure that you do what you can to assist in the prevention of this Orwellian vision not becoming a reality. We must see George Orwell's 1984 as a harsh lesson for what not to do, for what not to be, for what not to strive for. It should not be an instruction manual. But I'll close off this podcast um, in a moment, uh, just after the uh, the announcements. Uh, this podcast has been brought to you by uh, by Tackle, the AI system that uh, that enables you to cut off all those annoying things uh, from your services that you don't want to uh, to tarnish. Uh, your your service but uh, but yeah if you go to www.getyourtackleout.com forward slash a-a-u-t-z-m and uh, and enter the code name adam you can get 30 37 percent off um this podcast is also brought to you by russell brand caroline lucas and patrick stewart so i urge you all please tweet text email smoke signal whatever you got to do thank them for sponsoring this podcast link this podcast uh, along with your thanks of them and hopefully the like they will they will hopefully come on for at least 10 minutes to come on to discuss science and sustainability when applied to society and the environment yeah but uh, but yeah, I will close out this podcast with one of the most important lines of dialogue I think uh, from this film, and I think it it is in this notion that we need to attach our own motivation to give validity and meaning, meaning which we can then use to do our utmost to uphold. Quote: It is not so much staying alive. But staying human, that's important. What counts is that we don't betray each other. Thank you very much.